but now it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening. Jan Dubiel is a lifelong early years specialist. He started his career as a nursery and reception teacher. He was an early years consultant and advisor before moving on to early excellence, where he became head of national and international development. In 2018, he was on the Times Educational Supplement's 10 Most Influential People in the World of Education. What his biography doesn't say, though, is that Jan has an aunt who married someone from Jersey. And as a child, he was very impressed that she had a hole in her back garden hedge that led directly to the beach. What a disappointment then it was that as a seven-year-old, he discovered that she was moving to Portsmouth. So I leave you there and welcome Jan. I'm going to get my camera off now and leave you for the next hour or so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. I did a little anecdote um, in the sort of rehearsal this morning, and um, I'm glad it's made its way into introduction. Yes, um, I never forgave my aunt for moving from that house to Jersey, where we had incre incredible holidays to, to Portsmouth, which, um, no disrespect to Portsmouth, not quite, not quite the same um, holiday destination. And it was like a 20 minute drive to the beach. And there wasn't even, anyway, I'll leave it. I, I'm obviously clearly still bitter about it. So I, I'm going to let that go. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm actually delighted to be here virtually um, today. Uh, listening to those uh, presentations, it did, does remind me of the nature of us as, as early as educators. We have a, you need to know that your brain is different. If you work with young children, you have a different brain from normal people. Um, and what that does is it gives us a perception of the world. I'll talk about that in a moment and give you an example. But it also means we are incredibly and adaptable because working with young children means you have to. And we have to be. And we've just seen examples of that people having to take over each other's presentations and then having to readapt and doing it seamlessly and professionally and with um, with happiness and with well-being, and it's it's a joy to see, and that that's the nature of, of being an early years early years practitioner. So, you you need to remember you, your brain is different, just in the way that we shape children's brains with the experiences we give them. As you work with children, it in in ir, undeniably changes the way your brain is structured, and it stays with you. And I, I want to give you um, uh, just an example that happened to me um, fairly recently. Um, I, and I've been out of the classroom for some years now. I, I spent 10 happy, quite stress-free years as a nursery reception and year one teacher in normal circumstances. I'd expect you to, to perhaps chuckle at that, but obviously I can't hear. I hope you are. It's, I mean it um, ironically. Um, but even even that time shaped my brain um, to, to, to be what it is. And I was reminded of this recently when I was walking through, um, actually, well, recently before lockdown in the olden days, um, I was walking in the town where I live in, in, in the UK and um, there was uh, the back of these houses, there were some sort of hedges and there was there was a small hole in the hedge actually, it didn't lead to that, I just realised that analogy. Um, but the person I was with said, oh a fox lives in there, a fox lives in that hole. Now I knew when she said that she meant, you know, a fox went to sleep and dragged whatever they drag into their little dens and, and curled up and went to sleep. and. Uh, there. When she said the words a fox lives in there, my brain immediately pictured a fox in a little waistcoat sitting on a chair with its legs crossed, perhaps a pipe, fire in the corner. There was a split second where it constructed the image of a, an anthropomorphized version of the fox because I have read so many books in which animals behave like nor like people and it's completely normal so our brains are different and and we see the world in a different way because we are immersed in the world of children and because the world of children the world of earliest children is so demanding and so surreal and so um, unique it does shape the way we th see things but it gives us strength and it gives us superpowers as well as 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 you know we, we've just seen so um what i want to do in this session is is um it, i'm going to go and kind of jump about a bit because it's um it, it, putting these together was quite interesting um i want to give you quite some quite dense theory or certainly some things some some theoretical 
um, frameworks to think about. I want to give you some provocative key questions. And again, if we were doing this in the olden days when I would be in a room with you and we wouldn't necessarily be two meters apart, I would stop at that point and give you a chance to sort of process and talk about those questions. And that I've, I've learned the hard way that doesn't really work uh, in, in, virtual, um, in virtual training. So they're, they're things you're gonna have to take away with you and, and ponder at your own time. But I'll, I'll, I'll want to sort of give you some provocations around that. Um, and also woven into this is I want to use COVID-19 as almost a, a, a kind of case study exemplar of what, what the title talks about, examining core principles. But also attached to that, I want to give you some very, very practical, concrete advice um, that, that I have come across um, in, in the work that I've been doing over the past few weeks. You, you may be aware that... Um, in, in the UK, ch the children are now in earlier settings, reception, nursery, year one classes are now in their second week, getting to end their second week. So we have a little bit more experience, um, a little bit more um, sort of information about the things that, that have happened and, and the considerations that people have made. Um, we've also got the, um, the experience of Denmark who've been, um, who have been um, in kindergartens for several weeks now so they are even further along and, and I think a lot of the information we've drawn from has been from the Danish kindergarten experience <laughs> incidentally my mum and obviously my aunt were both Danish and I do have a Danish connection as well this is all becoming very kind of circular so I want to do several all those things together and and challenge you inform you give you things to think about um, reassure you hopefully um, also give you some some advice from the benefit of having gone through children coming back we we call it retransitioning you're calling it response and recovery which actually i, I really like um, and how it touches on some of those core principles so it's a, it's a, a, a kind of quite eclectic mix of um of things so um one of the things that that, that i think i said in the in the blurb to this is um situations like this like COVID-19 and the, the challenges it poses gives us the opportunity to view what we do through a very different lens um, as early as educators we, we are used to going out of our comfort zone we are used to thinking creatively uh, and what this has done has enabled us to do that and sometimes when you strip back the sort of routine and the habitual process of what you do you, you find very interesting views of, of your own practice and those things are always really, really good. We should always be examining our own practice, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. So I want to give you a construction. How do, how do we view what we do? As early as practitioners, you have around about a 1,000 interactions every single day in normal circumstances. And that, so that means if you've been working for children with children for three or years or so, you've had over a million interactions with children. That is an incredible um, evidence base, an incredible well of experience to draw from. And we take tens, thousands of decisions every single day. We are constantly making decisions about what to do, what to say, whether to intervene, whether not to intervene, and so on. And I want to start off really by examining a little bit some of the background to how that process works. So if I could have the next slide, it should be blank. And it is. Um, so when we start, when we make decisions, when we consider the automatic decisions that we are constantly making, and remember you in the subconscious as, as a practitioner, where do we start? We start with the next click. We start with values, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We have a set of core values, both as, as people, as, as adults, um, but specifically as educators. And again, in, in the olden days, what we might do at this point is look, get you to examine what, what are your values? What are the things that you think are important, things that you want to achieve with children? So your values are core to it. Next click. And values shape our beliefs. Beliefs and values are different. Your values very rarely change. They are core values you develop in early adulthood, but your beliefs do change. And um, me, <laughs> struck me actually earlier today that um, um, years ago, at this moment, I was doing my final placement 
as in my PCE in um, in England. It's a time of Italia 90, I don't remember that. Don't you remember that? And I was just about to embark on a, my teaching career. So I've been uh, 30 years as an early years specialist and a teacher and in all the other roles that, that, that have been <laughs> spilled already today. In that time, my beliefs have changed quite substantially and should do. Because when you read, when you attend sessions like this, when you watch children, when you talk to other um, other adults, when you ponder things on the way back from, from work, when you wake up in the night thinking, why did that happen? Why did that happen? All those things alter your belief system. So your beliefs are the vehicles by which you deliver your values. And we should always be open to changing those. One of the things I worry about sometimes in early years, we have a very strong tradition. Uh, across the globe and particularly sort of in the west and um and in the uk and, and its affiliated um, places we have very strong traditions and sometimes those traditions spill into becoming um folklore and folklore becomes orthodoxy and sometimes we have these things that we do and we don't really know why so actually examining how do your beliefs deliver your values is an important process next click shows where that ends up. So that ends up in the actions that you take. You know, you take thousands of decisions every day, an early years educator, a thousand interactions, which spawns probably several thousands, several thousand actions as a result. All of these emanate from values and should do. They emanate from your values as an educator. And that's what drives your beliefs and ultimately your actions. And um, I'll come on to that in a slide in a minute. So the next slide, so next click, is the evidence that informs it in between your values and your beliefs is evidence um highly contested highly controversial highly selective you are Just popping back in because I'm aware that um, we seem to have lost sound. I think we've also lost Jan's webcam. Ah, fabulous. Jan, we seem to have lost sound. Oh. Are we back? Can you hear me? I can now. Yes, I'm happy. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Um, so, um, the next click. is that interaction between the belief, your beliefs and evidence. So as you accumulate evidence and understanding, it influences your belief, not necessarily your values at this point, but your belief. Um, next click. And that in turn influences your values, sorry, influences your actions and your actions come back and your actions influence your beliefs. So there's this constant dynamic going on. This is, this is, why, this is why being an early years teacher is so exhausting because in the back of your mind subconsciously, you are constantly processing and acting on information. 
and you're doing it um, at an an incredible turbocharged rate. You think of a thousand interactions a day, how much thought, knowledge, belief, value goes into that. This, This is what you do and we need to acknowledge the complexity of that. It's not the same as other forms of teaching. It's unique to to early years. So next click. And the next one. And the next one. And the next one. So that's the process. That central core is how we work as practitioners. Curriculum and assessment, particularly those that are prescribed, work around that. And they should do, in in the best circumstances, be based on evidence and support our beliefs so that this becomes a process that we use. So um, if we move on, just comes to the time. So if we we move on, Uh, sorry, next slide, sorry. So um, why are values important? Values are important because they, as I've tried to show, they drive everything you do. Uh, They have an intrinsic worth and they reflect the choices we make. When I sometimes work with teachers or educators who are despondent and dispirited, they use phrases like, this wasn't signed up, what I signed up for, I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing anymore, I'm doing things which I know aren't right for children. And what's happened is they have become detached from their values. What they're doing no longer connects to the reality of the value of why they became educators. And when that happens, it's a very dangerous place to be because then, People start doing what they think they're supposed to do. They second guess. They try to please external agencies. They try and think, well, what what am I what what are people expecting me to do? And at that point, the connection between value, values and actions becomes lost. And that's the point we worry. So, if nothing else from today, what we need to take away is to be secure and um, clear about the values of why you what it is that's important what it is that you want children to be and i'll come up with some questions in a a moment so being connected with your values is critical and again in in the olden days if we had time this is we'd we'd sit and we'd we'd bash out and talk about some of what those what those values were i've done that hundreds of times and it's the same kinds of words that come up we do have this consensus um, in early years particularly, but I would say in education generally, about what it is we want for children. Those are value-driven um, a- um, uh, aspirations. So the next slide. And the next slide, because I've talked about that, values and beliefs, that's fine. Next slide. So um, really good book to read, um, uh, The Role of the Adult in Earlier Settings by Rose and Rogers. Uh, and talk very powerfully about how this influences your judgments, the nature of your interactions and your provision. Those are all value-based judgments. And there's no escaping from that because every decision is a value-based decision. But we have to be cognizant of it. We have to realize that we're not making a neutral decision. We're making a highly subjective, value-driven decision on the choice that we make. Uh, Next slide. So, Chris, to that is that process of self-reflection, taking the opportunity to analyze what we do and to examine it and to look at how that process of where what starts with values and ends up with actions um, gets informed by those things around us. So one of the things I talked to about practitioners because self-reflection and they talk about research, uh, reflective research and I'm talking about reflective research as a kind of organic in, in, internal thing. Sometimes just on the way home or when you have a, a spare moment, not obviously not during the day, but at, at home when you have a quiet, reflective moment, to so just pull out one decision that you've taken during the day. It could be an interaction, it could be the choice not to interact, it could be the provision of a particular resource, it could be an activity. Um, and to just to pull that apart, to examine what, 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 what were the choices I made in that? Um, how did it reflect my values? How, how effective was it and how do I know? That's how we train our brains to become those reflective analytical practitioners that work at the optimum level for supporting children, which is something I'll I'll come on to um, later, hopefully. Okay, so the next slide. Um, 
This is really summarised, um, again, I'm not going to read this in detail, but summarised fantastically by the work of Chris Pascal. Um, if you're not, I'm sure you're familiar with all uh, her work um, and her incredible um, footprint that she's left on um, early years development in, in certainly in the UK. Uh, she talks about this notion of an ethical praxis, and a praxis is a, a way of looking at things. And she says that's a fusion of lots of different things. So we go to the next slide. <laughs> Kelly, we all saw you, it's fine. Um, pedagogy is an ambiguous safe place, a one in three actions beliefs in a constantly renewed uh, process. So pedagogy is based on praxis. In other words, an action based on theory and sustained by belief systems. And this is the kind of nutshell of what she talks about. But it's this constant process of reevaluating what we do we understand uh, how we develop and what we learn as practitioners and the way our brains change to understand that is a constant process it, 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 it never ends and when we realize that and we reflect on what we do we become we optimize the effectiveness of, of our practice so um, next slide Um, that's just a quote from a book I wrote a few years ago, which is about the, how the locus of power exists with you as a, as a, as a, as the educator. I might come back to that later. Let's uh, let's do the next slide. So here here are my first uh, set of questions. So again, we're not going to uh, going to stop and discuss them virtually, but they, these are things to sort of take back with you. Um, so key, key questions, what, what do we mean by learning? What's the purpose of that? What do we mean by learning? Huge debates at the moment about the role of memory, the role of um, working memory, about what actually constitutes learning. Is learning just about change in long-term memory, which is one of the definitions that's becoming part of the dominant narrative? Is learning knowing to do something subconsciously or do you consciously have to recall it from your memory and so on? That those are big questions. So that, that's a, a, we use the word learning all the time, but what, what do we mean by it? Is it just the accumulation of facts or is it the application of them? You know, Roger Salyer's work on deep and surface level learning is, again, something we, we, we might factor into that. Um, and this idea of content, what we are increasingly, or have always described as the stuff that children need to learn. What, what does that need to consist of? Um, and, you know, we, we've touched on the, the situation that we're in at the moment, how COVID-19 has completely changed a lot of things, hopefully in the short term, but there will be long term impact. And one thing it has done is remind us that the world is a really unpredictable place. What, it, what we have had to do over the past few months is to change the way we are, to jettison things we take for granted and to act and to be and to, to live in a very, very different way. And that's a really good metaphor for, for the world that we are sending our children into. The children who you work with now are going into a world which will be as unpredictable as, as, as you know, the impact of, of COVID. Uh, so Ken Robinson talks about how we are preparing children for jobs that don't exist, for to solve problems we don't even know are problems yet. So um, in the context of that, what kind of curriculum do children need to know? Uh, do children need to, to, to be aware of? And finally, the process. How, how do we know that that's what we do and the vehicle by which children access whatever the content we believe to be? How do we know that's successful? Um, how do we know? How, how are we adaptable and agile enough in our pedagogy to, to make sure that that happens? What, what, what is the process? Um, Previously, previously to COVID, I did a lot of work in China. And there's a Chinese proverb I often use, which is, there are many paths to the top of the mountain, but the view is always the same. And for me, that's a really good um, metaphor for early years practice. The view is curriculum. That's where we want children to be. The path of how they get there might be substantially different and highly individual to that child. So um, the next next slide. So this gives us a good um, hook in to the purpose, the purpose of early child education. So these are our, if you like, these are the, the cornerstones of our key principles. We develop principles as educators. They are connected to our values and our beliefs, uh, I've touched on. 
Um, but they're there to answer very specific questions. So we talk about learning, and I've touched on that, and we talk about successful learning. That what, what do we mean by that? What is a successful learner in early childhood education? Is it just getting particular early learning goals, or is there something much broader and deeper and more expansive than that, which we consider to be a success? Just because something isn't measured or measurable doesn't mean it's not important. And actually, I would contend that much of what we do in early childhood isn't measured in a conventional way because it can't be. But that doesn't mean it's not part of that recipe or that cocktail of success that we look for. So again, th these, are, these are really good discursive questions uh, about you know, what we mean by a successful learner. How do we define that? How do we know when children leave our setting and transfer, transition to whatever the next phase is? And, you know, we close the door on that, that final time in the summer term, typically. Well, how do we know wh whether we've done the, a good job? What, what is it we look for? What is it we celebrate in that? Because that is what we define, uh, define a successful learner. And the components of that, again, are, uh, are quite similar. What do we want children to know? What is the content they need in order to be successful? Um, how do they use that? How do they utilise that? Which, again, I think we're... we're is embedded into good early years um, practice. And also, how do we want children to be? It's not just about what children know, it's about how they conduct themselves as individuals, as citizens. You know, and we use words like honesty and integrity and, and so on, that, that the future of civilization, the future of all nations, is built on what happens to children today. Those children in 30 years' time, 40 years' time, when they're at their peak, um, will be the, the, the individuals that their families and us have shaped. So what, what are the qualities in that that we think are really important? So part of the curriculum, part of what we want for children, isn't just about um, concrete knowledge and academic and cognitive knowledge. It's about those what sometimes I think inaccurately called non-cognitive non skills, but they're about the qualities of the person that holds that information. Okay, so if we could have the next slide, please. So this brings us to um, where we are at the moment, the, the, the challenges, as I kind of meekly put it at the moment. We have a, a huge tension, don't we, between um, the very real danger of COVID-19 and the risk of cross infection and and you know let's not let's not undervalue the fact that this is a a, a, a global pandemic that has killed i think in the region of half a million people uh, possibly more so far um that has rendered the economy completely um you know <laughs> destroyed for, for for the time being which has cut a deep swathe into into to everyday life everyone is is really affected by it. i'm really old and I've never lived through anything like this. This has completely challenged my perception of myself, of how to be, of the things, as I said, jettisoned things that we took for granted. So we are talking about um, response and recovery. We are talking about children returning to settings, but there is a tension there because um, we need to keep children safe. So that is a big dimension, a specific lens through which we're going to have to view practice and pedagogy and as I said it's, it's almost a case study for looking at core values because on the other side we know that children in lockdown, children being separated from uh, peers, from everyday life, from routine, in some cases from structure, in some cases being separated from safety, we know that that has ha is, is, that is and will have and is having a dramatic impact on those children's emotional long-term health and development. We also know that children are growing up now in a context which is not normal. We are, they are picking up messages about connect, contact with other people, about being too close to other people. Um, things which several months ago we, we wouldn't have considered in the same way. So we have, um, and this is particularly relevant for early childhood, because older children will have had been around the block a few times and they will have other experiences to draw from. Very young children of nursery age, pre-nursery age, reception age, they are just starting their understanding of the world and their understanding of, of schooling and the enculturation of schooling. So actually that has been critically and um, acutely disrupted. So there is 
some real tensions in um, in what COVID-19 has brought us. But within that, as I said, it gives us the opportunity to really examine um, key principles. If we move on to the next slide. Um, let's do the next one. Um, uh, to the next one. So one of the ways in which, and I'm, I'm using UK government advice here, um, just because it, some of it is, is broadly sensible in terms of uh, the, the model it's providing, and certainly it's one that, that um, reception nursery classes are, are using. So it talks about the importance of the ratios and the creation, as we've heard already, of this idea of bubble, a small isolated group that is, does not socially distance from itself, but socially distances from other children. So the idea of the bubble is that that is quite um, strictly observed, quite draconianly observed, and those children have no contact with other people. But there is an acceptance, and again, it's part of that, that balance and, and equating those things together, that young children, A, cannot socially distance, and B, what psychologists are increasingly saying it is actually harmful for them to do that. If we start teaching them, not to have contact, to, to, to constantly be two metres away from every other person, that is going to have a long-term impact on the emotional and social welfare. So the idea is that we create these bubbles which are self-sustaining, that they create a degree of normality for those children, but they, they reconcile that challenge of safety. Um, and one of the things, and I, I might come back to this, is I think at the moment, when children do go back in, in, to, in September, um, we, we have a duty to, to, to teach them and to support them in understanding that this isn't normal. Um, we are in an extreme situation. Most predictions are that this will start tailing off eventually. Um, but until there's a vaccine for COVID-19, it is going to be with us. So there will always be this tension of how do we reconcile children's safety with um, with with providing them with the curriculum. Um, so we need to teach them that it's not normal. Also, we need to teach them that it will change and it will get better. And as things um, reduce, as things get loosened, we can show children that actually there's a, a hopeful journey to get back to what is more typical, although what the new norm will be, we're, we're, we're unclear. Okay, so um, next slide. So this brings us to the core of what we do. If values, beliefs and actions are the core of the decisions we take, how that's um, enshrouded is in between the interrelation between curriculum, assessment and pedagogy. Um, and again, what's been very interesting with COVID-19 is this gives us a different lens to view these. And because the requirements and the challenges are so acute and so specific, Actually, it gives us um, a really good opportunity to look at what we mean by curriculum, what we mean by assessment, and what, particularly what we mean by pedagogy in situations which are highly, highly unique. And let's be clear, the cohort that starts back whenever this happens, in, in possibly in this term, which is happening in, excuse me, in the UK, more likely in September, which is uh, more, more typical globally, that is going to be an atypical cohort. It won't be like a cohort, even if you're a very experienced teacher, that you've ever taught before. They will all have experienced a degree of trauma. Their, their routines will have been disrupted. Um, they will be living in a radically different world, which will remain different for a period of time. And my, my hypothesis is we will have an, uh, the 2021 academic year will be a very unique year. And I think by the end of it, by the time we get to June, July 2021, I think the degree of normality will, I think, unless we have a second spike and we can't predict any of these things, but as things are, we'll, we will be start to return to something we recognise more, more as normal. But until then, we have to be really reflective and adaptive, and as I said, agile in, in how, how that works. So if we look at curriculum, which is the next slide, So what is curriculum? Curriculum is what needs to be learned. Curriculum is, in essence, dull, dry, and quite boring. It's just objectives of this is the stuff 
that children need to need to learn. My colleague Beth Harris from Red Panda says, the role the earliest teacher is to teach children what they need to know. Our, if we sh distill down our job to its kind of basic level, our job as educators is to deliver the curriculum. And I know even saying the words, that sounds really, really dull. It isn't because of what we do, but that is our job. Our job is to take children to the top of the mountain and show them the view the curriculum, the outcomes that we want for children. So that's the nature of curriculum. We go to the next slide. Um, really good document which was produced um, just to, towards the end of last year, um, getting it right at the earliest foundation stage. This was a, a summary and um, Chris Pascal was involved in it, so you know it's going to be quality. It was a summary of all the evidence of the last 10 years of what we know matters to young children and the purpose of this was to try and inform the review of the ELGs uh, whether the, the, the government took it on or not is, 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 is still, you know, the jury's still out I think as we, we await for a response. But what it did was identify the things that really matter and you know if you, if you look on the left hand side of that pane those, those are the kinds of things which incontrovertibly were identified through longitudinal studies, comparative studies, looking at neuroscience, um, looking at uh, the impact of different kinds of pedagogies and so on, uh, and particularly looking at the long-term um, longitudinal outcomes of, of children. So the role of language, the role of PSD, physical development, which you, know, you recognize as the prime areas in the UIFS, the core of what happens, but also things like executive, um, executive function, sorry, self-regulation, executive functioning, metacognition, inhibitory control. These are all the things that, if they are present, as children transfer from the UIFS into uh, to, to, to year one into the national curriculum, children are likely to be successful. If they are not present, what research and evidence tells us is children are less likely to be successful going forward. So when we think about curriculum, what is it children need to be learn, need to learn? Those are the things which research and evidence tell us need to be a core part of it. So park that for a moment, bear that in mind because we'll move on in a minute and might come back to that. So the next slide. Uh, Lillian Katz, American, um, famous American uh, educator, she talks about the difference in curriculum between academic and intellectual goals. Academic is the, the content, the stuff that you need to know, but the intellectual goals are those that, uh, as she said, address the, the life of the mind in its fullest sense. Um, and the next slide, you can go to that one, is how she defines curriculum. Appropriate curriculum is at six. Mastery of basic skills in the service of their intellectual pursuits. And it goes back to one of those questions. What, what is the purpose? How do we want children to be? Well, we want children who can not just acquire information, but we want children who can utilize that information. And actually, one of the things COVID has taught us is that the unpredictability of the world means we are going to need to think and be and use information very, very differently. So part of our responsibility is to deliver curriculum that's not just knowledge, of course knowledge is important, and you can't do anything without it, but how you utilize knowledge, because that is a learned behavior. You learn how to make connections, you learn how to transfer information. This is all part of uh, the, what, what is described as executive functioning. So that's part of our responsibility in curriculum. The, um, if we can go to the next slide, This gives us the challenge of what COVID-19 and the return post lockdown actually requires us to do. So if curriculum is all the things that we've talked about, but it's about what we want children to know, then the curriculum we need for children returning to nursery reception classes has to be based on what is really important for them. So I would say, given the challenges of COVID, given the challenges of lockdown, we certainly need a curriculum that is fundamentally driven by understanding the importance of health and hygiene. We have a responsibility to do that for children. That has to be a fundamental part of the curriculum. But also, and we've touched on this already, 
emotion, well-being and emotional literacy, the, these children will be traumatized to a greater or lesser degree. You, you talked already about the Leuven scales, which I would say is a, a good starting point for that. But actually, it almost goes more, um, more, deep, uh, more significant and, and deeper than that. Um, because we have to track those children in those first few weeks to make sure that their security is going to be embedded. And one of the things that um, has come from the testimonies from, from teachers whose children have already returned is that um, children respond to this very differently. Some of them will tell you everything immediately in the first few minutes. Other children will be very quiet and will seep out in a while. But all of them will have a story to tell. All of them will be wrestling with um, things that are different and challenging and have upset them and have affected them deeply. So we need to take that, this is meeting the needs of children, and make that centre stage to the curriculum, a curriculum that balances that, that tension that I talked about, that keeps them safe and teaches them about safety, just like we would teach them about crossing the road. We are in a context now and children will know about it. Of course they will. They'll know about COVID-19. They'll know about social distancing. They'll know about self-isolation. They'll know about two weeks incubation period. They'll be remarkably knowledgeable because it's all around them. To teach them how we manage that in a way that makes sense to them, but also reassures them. Because by keeping safe and by keeping hygienic, we are reducing and narrowing the risk of that. Um, the next slide. Secondly, um, perhaps slightly off centre stage, but still very much in the focus, is that um, the opportunities and the importance of social development. One of the things that um, people are noticing when children are coming back is they have been out of practice with relating to peers, with negotiating, with compromising. In some cases, they've been the only child in their house. Sometimes they've had older siblings or younger siblings. But that dynamic of working with your peers is something they have lost experience of. So again, that has to be um, a really strong focus. And again, that has to be taught and shaped. Our curriculum has to embed and cradle children into um, uh, what they're going to need in order for the more you know, obvious academic things to take place. Um, and what um, reception year one, uh, nursery year one teachers are noticing is that uh, those children's social development is it has taken somewhat of a back step because of lack of experience. What's quite interesting about language development, again, one of the primaries is many teachers are saying children's language has come on leaps and bounds because they have had uninterrupted, undulterated, one-to-one -one conversations with adults constantly throughout this process. So actually. In some cases, you might be surprised at how articulate and how confident children are in language. But what I would add to the importance of language is, again, the language of emotional literacy and the importance of talking about emotions and understanding them and being able to name them. Now, we always do that in, in early years. And actually, Ferrer's, Ferrer Lava's work on is bo the box of feelings, I don't know how widespread that is alongside um, the Lugan scales, is a really good resource, a really good vehicle for being able to articulate and name feelings. And that's going to be vital for children coming out of this extreme experience into what we want to make as normal as possible, as quickly as possible. So the, um, the next slide, um, actually let's go to the next slide because I'm conscious of time. So the second uh, part of that diagram is pedagogy and pedagogy is the interesting bit. Pedagogy is the path going to the top of the mountain, it's how you make the curriculum alive. The curriculum is, a, is quite dull, quite dry, it's about the stuff we want children to learn, it's, it's kind of quite narrow in its sort of content. Pe is the, the vehicle by which children understand and access the curriculum. So it's how we make it alive. We, we are focused on outcomes, we are focused on what that will give us, but the way we do it will be um, individual and shaped around individual children. The interface between the science of learning and the craft of teaching. How to make the curriculum relevant and alive for those children. So we go on to the next slide. Really good definition of teaching. This is from uh, Ofsted the Inspection Framework in, um, in the UK. Um, and their definition of teaching um, epitomizes or sums up really what that pedagogy should look like. 
teaching is not just about direct instruction. It is everything you do, every decision you take. And remember, thousands of decisions, a thousand interactions a day. Um, Daniel Kamen says we take between 10 and 20,000 decisions every single day. And m most of them uh, are what he calls the type A subconscious um, decisions. So everything we do is about shaping the possibility and the vehicle for those children to access um, the, the, the curriculum. So the, the next slide. In the EYFS framework, and again, I'm conscious I'm coming at this from a very UK or English uh, perspective, is about this idea of balance, an ongoing judgment in the balance of activities led by children and those guided by adults. Personally, I think balance is the wrong word. I'll come to that in, in a minute and look at a little piece of research. But it's about making sure that there is this symbiosis between stuff you teach and things that children internalize and make sense of themselves. Now, I think in the context we're in, children are going to need lots of opportunities to tell their stories, to, in, to make sense and to understand what has happened to them and what they need to move forward. So this idea of this fusion between direct teaching and children's self-led learning, child-led learning, it becomes a really, really important one. It's a fundamental tenet of all early, early childhood philosophy and, and particularly in the UIFS. So the next slide, is um, that I'm going to race through these. You'll get these slides and I will um, advise you to, to read them. It's from a document for Laying Foundations for Life, Health and Learning by Claire Tickell. Um, we had another review of the UIFS in 2011, um, nearly 10 years ago now actually, and um, part of that review, uh, then Claire Tickell undertook um, a review which then went to, to sort of form the new EYFS, which is one that's just been reviewed because so, nothing ever stays still. But in that, um, although this is quite old now, this is 10 years old, this is the sequence of statements I use to look at that dynamic between um, child-led and adult-directed activity. It is something um, that we, we do wrestle with, and it is something which is subject to a lot of mythology and it's subject to a lot of angst amongst teachers. How do I get that right? How do I get that balance right what's the right amount of time i should be allowing children to lead their own learning what's the right amount of time i should be directly teaching should i intervene or should i not intervene i think that um, i often talk to educators right across the board in in early years who, who do really wrestle with that so um i'm not going to read this through i'm just going to summarize it um to start with and then i i would advise you i mean to read read the document the appendices particularly for that um, because it talks about uh, the background of characteristics of effective learning and why that's really important. But what she talks about in terms of pedagogy, I think, is, is immensely powerful. Now, I've not yet seen it anywhere articulated as well as she does. And to sum it up, which is what this first slide does, is she talks about this idea of a flexible approach um, and a professional judgment about when, when not to intervene based on level development of the individual child. Now, she goes into more depths, and, and uh, I, I'm not going to cover those slides, I'm conscious of time. Um, but it's a really interesting and important way of viewing that sense of judgment, that sense of professionalism about what we think is most important. And we're back to that first slide. What is it your values system is telling you about the importance for that child? How is that influencing your belief? And how does that come out in action? For far too much of the time in early years, we try and second guess what we think we're supposed to do. And actually, what we call intuition is our most valuable resource. There's a, a really good book called Sources of Power by Gary Klein. And it's about how we make decisions. Um, and in that, he it's not an educational book, it's about the psychology of decision making. He says that um, as highly skilled professionals in whatever field, we have this well of experience and this well of experience informs our decisions in a subconscious way. So often what we think of as intuition or gut feeling isn't something fluffy. Actually, it's based on you subconsciously pulling on information that you have and knowledge and evidence that you have. So if you think about a thousand interactions a day, thousands of decisions you make every single day, 
as you become more experienced that that's all there that's all there in your subconscious so when you react to something and you think you're doing it without thinking you are automatically pulling on existing knowledge and and really that's at the heart of what she says here we 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 have too much angst about trying to get this right rather than trusting our own judgment and i think what covid-19 and the response to that will, will give us is um is should be a real impetus for allowing ourselves to trust what we know is right for children so um and what works for specific children in specific contexts so if we click on the next slide um which is about the fluidity of that that interaction and the next slide and the next slide and the next slide um, actually we go to the next slide after that sorry I'm just conscious of times so you will get these slides so you will be able to um, to, 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 to to read them one of the things Iram Saraj talks about in the epi study is that um, again which which I think Claire Deco was building on is again that 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 ability and that confidence to respond. Forget about what you think you're supposed to do and to work very specifically and intuitively um, with that child. Now what's really interesting is this, this is backed up by some really good research which came out of the EPI project. If we go to the next slide. So what the EPI research found out is that um, some settings and some contexts had very good outcomes and some of them had excellent outcomes and the researchers were really interested in what you know what is the difference between these two kinds of these settings which in all other respects were very similar I and mean, you take all the variables out there there was you know a significant difference in the kind of outcomes they had for children they weren't just academic outcomes they were social pro-social and so on so they started analysing some data and they kind of looked at these, these in more detail. Um, and what we have here was the kind of result of some of that analysis. So they looked at high cognitive challenge. They looked at, as you're all familiar with Leuven scale, what we would now describe as level five involvement, when children are immersed, completely immersed in a moment in time. Um, and they're you know, firing on all cylinders and making synaptic connections, really in, engrossed in what they're doing. Um, we know that's an indicator of high level learning and what they looked at um, as well was the, the context in which that happens and what they found out was very interesting so the blue slide or sorry the blue bar is um, adult led activity so in the blue bar there was pretty much same amount of intense high level cognitive challenge in adult led activities whole group and small group mostly small group but some whole group so that was that that wasn't that wasn't the variable the variable was child led activity because the red bar is child led activity without an adult presence and the one in the middle the stripy one or the pink one is child led activity which was then supported by an adult and that was the difference between good and excellent outcomes if you look at those two bar sets of bar charts um, you can see that probably the difference between them is the red bar shrinking into the, the pink bar, the stripy bar. That meant that the excellent outcomes was dependent on adults taking the decision to get involved in children's learning to support their child-led learning. And when you have the confidence to do that, you see these moments of possibility where a provocation giving a child a resource, a question, a suggestion, a piece of interaction, some the potential for some sustained shared thinking. Those are the optimum moments in children's learning when their learning progresses. When you scaffold it as an adult, it remains a child-led activity. The child is still in control of its direction and its purpose, but you are shaping it to take it beyond, you know, the gut skin into the zone of proximal development. And that was the difference between good and excellent outcomes. So this confidence, this intuition, this gut feeling about what feels right for children is something, again, that we should have the centre stage. 
as something we should learn a lot more to trust because actually it has a very strong scientific and evidence base. So if we go on to the um, next slide. So what does that mean in terms of COVID-19? COVID what might be the particular considerations? Um, well, read what it says about key person and the key person approach and attachment. If children have ever needed the, the, the principles and the spirit of the key person approach, then it, it will be now. They will need additional and quite acute security in terms of moving forward and retransitioning, re-entering, entering school. Um, to take your lead from the child to be sensitive in terms of that interaction and again this has come across with some of the testimonies from from some of the teachers some children will say everything straight away others will it will drip over time some children may never want to talk about it in their reception year their nursery year it might not emerge until much later and it might emerge in ways we, we don't expect through drawings or through stories and so on um, to create an environment i'll talk about that in a moment which enables storytelling and communication um, I would argue that through storytelling, through drawing, through communicating in different ways, children will make sense of their experiences and they will be able to tell their stories, even if they don't really understand the feelings behind them, but they will be able to express that and communicate that, even if it's just to themselves. So <clears throat> our pedagogy has to support that opportunity for, for, for doing that. So... Um, Obviously, opportunities for uh, familiar um, typical activities. Um, I would argue we need some structure, which isn't necessarily the same as a strict timetable, but some structure, some level of predictability that children can lock into. But also opportunities for deep, char deep, deep child-led learning, maybe supported by an adult, maybe not. But opportunities to really internalise some of those things and be able to um, express them. Um, and the, the phrase we're hearing at the moment in, in England uh, is um, uh, uh, support and closing the gap, obviously, but also in catching up. Children need to catch up because they miss school. Now, um, we need to appropriate that phrase as quickly as possible and say, actually, the catching up they need to do isn't necessarily necessarily in literacy, in numeracy and academic subjects, it's actually catching up on that emotional security in order to enable that to happen. So we can go on to the next um, slide. Um, the learning environment will be critical and probably be, is one of the most fraught aspects that teachers have um, uh, sort of been wrestling with. We still should have the principles of an enabling environment, an environment that enables children to make choices. Um, what I have said, and I will continue to say, is COVID-19 and coming back to school after lockdown is not an excuse to Victorianise um, early years classrooms. They do not need desks. They do not need to have desks that are two metres apart, nor do they need to have mats, and they stay on the mat all day. That's just a desk in a different form. They can socialise. We are not expecting them to socially distance. And actually, if they don't have access to environment which enables them and enables them to make choices and enables them to follow their own learning, we will be doing them long term damage. So environments will need to be stripped back. I'll come to that in a minute. But we should still have enabling environments in which children can make choices. Um, needs to be spaces for small group and whole group. I think whole group, um, whole group activities, particularly at the beginning of the day, I would argue will be critically important in creating that, the identity and community of that bubble. And actually some of the tensions which will inevitably arise, that, that's your opportunity to kind of set them out and to, to deal with them. Um, in terms of your resources, uh, you do need to balance what mitigates safety um, with what children can access. Um, so certainly the experience of Denmark and in the UK English settings is all resources need to be cleaned every single day. So you need to look at each area of provision and you say, can I clean this every day? Um, and if I can't, then perhaps that's something that we don't use at the moment. Process, as I've talked about, is the loosening of things and as things become warmer, things become more open, you can start reintroducing resources that you didn't. 
So I have said to err on the side of caution, I, I don't think we can have sand, I don't think we can have mud kitchens, I don't think we can have anything that we can't clean considerably cons consistently at the end of each session. Interesting, um, um, you might, you, know, you can Google what the, I've become an expert in how long viruses live on different objects. Um, for example, vi the virus lives on paper for um, up to five days. Now that poses a problem because paper can't be put in the washing machine, it can't be cleaned in the same way. Now I would say a book area is a vital part of the environment. So what we have, the advice we're giving is that you quarantine resources that you can't clean. So you find out the, the, the likely longevity or the maximum longevity that the virus will have on books, for instance, which is five days, and you have a system where you quarantine books for a day for five days at a time, and then you reintroduce them um, into the, the kind of flow of, of each bubble. Um, so we need to think about um, quarantining resources if we can't clean them. The other thing they did in Denmark, which was really successful, was they rotated resources because environments will never be stripped, be stripped back, and they will be mostly plastic things, things you can clean. Um, they would introduce a box each day, which would have different resources in it, and the children would only have that for one day. So it's like a, a form of enhancing those areas of provision, um, and in that there would be different resources that children could use, and then it would move on. It would be clean, and then it would be moved on to the next class. The other thing that they did was um, each child had their own individual resource bag or tray. So resources they would need all the time, things like scissors, their own prick stick possibly, their own colouring pencils, ordinary pencils, any resources which they're using all the time, they would have their own ones that would stay at school and could only be used by those children. And as part of the routines and expectation, we would explain that. And alongside that, we would explain that this is because of COVID-19. This isn't normal, this is different, but we're doing this because this reduces the risk. At all points, I think we have to make that manageable but explicit to children. So there's no right and wrong answer about which um, areas of provision you have. Um, you make a decision about what's practical. I spoke to someone <laughs> a week before they started and they said, I have to have loose parts. I can't possibly run a reception class without a loose parts area. Uh, and I said, okay, that's fine, but you, you will have to clean each of those loose parts every single day. Uh, if you can do that, it's manageable, it's logistical, then absolutely. But again, we're, we're managing what is safety with what is possible for children. There's no list of areas of provision that I think you should or shouldn't have, but as I've touched on in terms of curriculum, I think there are certain areas which, which are going to be important in, in allowing children to do what they need. So certainly things like mark making a small world, to be able to storytell, to be able to communicate, they are going to be vital in terms of that. It seems like um, similarly small construction would be a part of that as well. Um, if you want Play-Doh, then you can, but you would have to make it each day for each child. Some people are doing that, or they're doing it occasionally to give children, you know, again, access to that when they need it. Um, and water, again, you, you can squirt sort of Milton and uh, things in water to, to, to keep to keep a, a lid, if you like, on, on the risk of infection. Um, or you could do what happens in some Montessori settings, you have a small tray and children do small water play. So that's really vital to you. It is communicable, but um, you can manage that risk in, in some way. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Part of that, again, would also be the routine of the day, and um, we've, we've, we've touched on that a little bit. Um, I would argue a, a routine is not the same as a, a timetable, and you would have to be flexible, but I would, I would if I was being a reception, uh, or nursery teacher now, I would I would have a routine in place that children could rely on, and it it would create a predictable structure so that they would have a sense of a sense of order and a sense of sort of continuity and consistency in what they're doing. Of course, you would adapt it, and of course, you will go in different directions as is dictated by by the children. But having that structure in place, even if you deviated from, it, I think it's really important. Um, Two resources I would suggest, I mean, Fair Love is Box of Feelings, I would suggest is a, is, would be a really good example, a good opportunity to explore some of those uh, kind of emotional challenges. Uh, and, and there's, again, as, as you 
people know from the work of um, Vera Love, as there's a, a huge theory and psychology and evidence base behind that. And also Jenny Mosley and her Circle Time Resources. If you if you Google that, um, there's again it's a, it's a, it's a philosophy philosophy uh, and approach about using Circle Time, particularly to support and to nurture children's uh, personal, social, and emotional development. Okay, um, final slide or next slide. So finally, that brings us uh, to assessment. Um, uh, uh, in a sense, this links into a lot of what I've said already. But remember, assessment is what we, how we know teaching is being successful and knowing and understanding children in order to support their development. So assessment is not record keeping. Certainly in England and the UK, there is no expectation that, um, for instance, the profile is completed or um, any assessments are particular, any specific assessments. So this, uh, I would say in this context, because the needs are so specific and they are so unique and they are so shaped around a very particular challenge that your assessment uh, would need to reflect that. So if we go on to the next slide, Again, this is examining principles through COVID. Assessment, I would say, is one of the least affected because it ha would happen in the usual way. It would happen by observing children, by talking to them, by teasing out information and understanding, particularly in terms of the curriculum of uh, emotional well-being, um, health and hygiene, language um, and, and, and social development, what you're seeing and what that tells you about individuals and co groups of children and how you can then support it. Assessment isn't a single standing entity. Assessment has a purpose, and its purpose is support, how we support, how we um, generate and develop those children. Um, certainly, I would say the communication with parents and carers becomes possibly even more vital because you, children will say things that which you mean, might need to pick up with parents and remembering that you, you can't have that face-to-face -face contact in the same way. So you, you might need to explore digital or other ways of, of communicating that. Um, record what you need to, the same principles um, exist to record what you're going to forget, what's significant for a child and what helps you understand them as a learner. There is no expectation you record things, you record what you record is for you as a practitioner, and that, that's always been the case, and it's kind of crystallized and intensified by, by the experience. Um, consider using the Luden scales for wellbeing involvement if you don't already. Um, it's a really good vehicle into to understanding um, what those children uh, are going to need. Okay, and if we go to the next slide, <laughs> that brings me to the end of the presentation. So I, I realise I galloped through some of it um, because I was conscious of the time. Um, I hope that's given you reassurance more generally about your role as a practitioner and the kinds of thinking and the kind of reflection that's required in that. Um, I also hope it's certainly given you food for thought in terms of how to structure that uh, response and recovery and the return to school. Um, one thing I will say, and I'll, I'll just finish with this because it, um, it, it, it may help. Um, do we need to, my webcam's gone. Um, what teachers are saying in England is um, the biggest anxiety was the preparation. The biggest anxiety was creating the bubbles, thinking about resources, how will this work, how will rotation work, how will quarantine work. Then when the children turned up, they just went into teaching and they said within a very short space of time, the challenges and the demands of this phenomenal thing that has happened to us kind of shrunk down. And it was about how you work with children. You, you are teachers, you are educators, don't forget what you know. It will click in as soon as the children turn up. As soon as you are in a room with children, whatever resources like, whatever has happened, you click into that that's because we're, we're biologically and mentally primed to do that and it won't be as bad as it might you might worry about it beforehand and that's probably a good place to finish thank you very much john that was absolutely amazing thank you so much <laughs> i mean what i can't believe actually is that there is absolutely no questions in the chat box and i think that's because you've actually had people absolutely spellbound um so if you'd like to 
come back in again, we can. Yeah, sorry, I don't know why. I don't know why that happened. Sorry. Sorry. Also, uh, sorry. I, I, I. There's no light in this room. I've just realised. I just tried to flick the switch, and the light's not working. So, um, I apologise for how kind of grim and um, dark I'm. I'm looking. So I apologise for that in advance. No, I mean, we well, have a question that people uh, submitted when they um, registered for tonight's seminar. Mm. What I think mm. has been incredible has actually been the fact that you've responded to so many of those questions anticipating what it was that people were going to be asking. Um, there were one or two, though, that I think it would be helpful. Uh, you know, there, were, there was a lot of questions around social distancing, but I think you've really covered that uh, very ably. There were other questions around some of the specifics around Jersey in terms of the significant numbers of children who might be Portuguese, Polish, Romanian, other nationalities, um, and children who will be start, so those children may start school with very little English, um, and others who may have little or no nursery experience. And I just wonder if you might want to comment on how best we might think about supporting their transition. Mm. Well, um, it's, that's, that's a really, really good question. And I think it kind of goes back to the, the title of this, 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 um, this session and uh, that it's significant, substantially different, but significantly the same, or maybe it's the other way around, I, I can't remember. The, the, um, what we are dealing with, and I think what come, when, when we distill all this down, is we are talking about principles of transition. And transition into a nursery or reception class is, is, is an event anyway, even in the olden days before COVID-19. What COVID-19 has perhaps intensified some of those things and added dimensions that we hadn't previously needed to um, uh, accommodate. But the principles of transition and for the children for whom English is additional language remain the same. It's about connecting with the parents. We might need to do that in a slightly different way. It's about managing that transition so that you secure the child in the setting. It's about providing them with familiar objects, with experiences that they can connect with, with the reassurance, with um, the key person and so on. We are complicated by the fact that certainly as things stand, my advice has been that obviously parents can't can't come in the bubble because it just you know would disrupt the bubble, disrupt the integrity of the bubble. So we are dealing with that. What some schools are doing is having little um, areas by the classroom where parents and children can be for a while together if that's necessary. But then taking the decision, if the child is so distressed and they're finding this so difficult, then then perhaps being at school that isn't appropriate. But certainly, I, I, I would say that the principles of transition that you operate already, look at them and, and look at your policies for transition and think, if, if I say, you know, again, the olden days we would have this as a discussion, you know, what are the key principles of transition? Those are the same. Those are the same. And also, if children are new, that, that the environment won't be peculiar to them. That's their environment, that's their new environment. And again, what reception nursery teachers have said in England is they've been amazed at how quickly reception teachers have just reception children have just adapted and accepted this different environment with less resources, with resources coming around, resources being quarantined, and they've just accepted it because that's the reality and they are very, very adaptable. So I think in terms of children as an additional language, I think those those principles will will still hold the same. Okay. I mean, what strikes me is that actually you've rapidly become an expert on viruses and things that you never ever anticipated <laughs> you were ever going to have to think about. It's, it's, I mean, it's yes. I don't think I've, 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 the times I've used the phrase cross infection in the last couple of weeks is, is probably in its thousands, which isn't something you expect, is it? No. I think we've learned a whole new vocabulary, I really do. Yeah, so another question was around um, children in year one and how, you know, that might be different in terms of our current reception children who've missed quite an amount of their reception year. And how can we best support our year one teachers, um, you know, thinking about this September coming up? 
Yes, I, and I think um, what, what those year one teachers will have is children who haven't completed a reception year. Now, if we those we use, we use the profile and just use the profile in, in, in England, one of the key principles of profile is that if children don't attain a, a good level of development, they haven't achieved um, a two or the, good, the early learning goal in, in a number of areas, by default, that means those children aren't ready for the national curriculum. So what we will have, and there's always a handful of children in each class who, who come under that come under that um, definition. Now, I think what we will have in September is much larger numbers of children who won't be secure in the early learning goals because they will have missed a whole range of experience. Now, I think what that gives us permission to do and is our instinct to do is to create envi an environment and a pedagogy and approach which supports that, particularly in that first term. So as they come back, you are almost saying, well, before we move to what are the expectations for year one, they have to make sure they're secure. And that might be kind of completing the reception year in a, slight, in a slightly different way. And certainly in some areas that that might need to be quite intense. You know, I've talked about how a lot of children's language is actually <laughs> made leaps and bounds. But certainly in social development, certainly in understanding routines and expectations, those things we might need to enforce quite clearly and quite explicitly in, in the beginning of that. Um, what I worry about is um, the phrase up to mean actually there's a big chunk of curriculum that's missing and that has the priority as in you know uh, cognitive oh. curriculum, academic yeah. curriculum. Now I'm not saying that's not important, of course it is, but that curriculum and understanding and accessing that curriculum rests entirely on the security and well-being and emotional um, consistency of those children so so we have to prioritize that not because we're trying to get out of anything but because that's how it will make it effective for children so year one teachers that I've worked with um, who will have because in, in in England they're gonna I don't know if you're aware of this in England it's about a 50% take up at the moment so we've got 50% of children who will come into year one um, having not been in school since the beginning of March yeah. So there is going to be a lot of work in securing that. And, and I think, you know, we have to take, we have to trust our professional judgment on what is going to work best for those children. And we have to take it at a rate at which those children can, can, can cope with it. They're going to be managing a whole host of, of different things. And I think that's a message that, you know, if you wanted to get one message from tonight, actually it's about what feels right for children and trust in terms of what we know works for children. Um, in the chat, Absolutely. there's a question around parents, um, and we talked a lot about children this evening, but perhaps less so about parents and families' expectations. Mm. Um, you know, I think we, perhaps it would be helpful just to think for a minute about what it is that we'll need to think about in terms of reassuring parents that you know we, we are genuinely focusing on the well-being of children and that actually that's not at the expense of maths literacy whatever it is down the line yeah, absolutely yes and what's um what's quite interesting is um certainly the the parents who are in, I'm talking about the English context here specifically the parents who are choosing not to send their children back are doing it because they are concerned about their well-being and uh, whether it's safe for them and so on so we do have a um, uh, an understanding of that importance um, my experience of parents so far has been they have really reached you know they, they really understand why this is important Parents, I, most parents and parents, certain parents I've spoken to and, and through via teachers that they've spoken to, their, their prime concern is children's well-being. So I, I think we are, it feels like we are pushing out an open door in terms of that. And I think if we are careful to explain to parents that this is a process and by securing children and making sure they are emotionally um, secure in the environment and the routines and expectations and skills, we will introduce those more academic um, 
questions when it's appropriate for them. Um, I, I, again, this is this is looking at effective practice um, through a slightly different lens, but the principles are the same. We, we do things at the rate in which we think it optimises it for children, and we are professionals. One of the things that's really come across is that children not being at school means they don't get a school experience. It's not the same as being at and, and I think eventually this will filter through and parents will have uh, that respect for the professionals of what we do that they, they come to school because we are trained to make those kinds of decisions and I, I think we should be bold in encouraging people to respect that and say well as a professional this is the decision that i take I, I don't think these children this child is ready for that level of demand while they're still wrestling with obviously um, a, a whole range of experiences which they're they're yet to articulate and and yet to to um, be able to communicate Okay, there's no more questions in the chat, so I'm going to say to you, John, I am absolutely in total admiration for the way that you've managed this virtual experience. I think it's been incredible. Um, and I think you focus on doing the right thing and the engagement through a curriculum of care, in a sense, will just stick with everybody who's attended this evening. If you get an opportunity to go through the chat later, and we can certainly forward it to you, you will see the most amazing right, yes, comments because, yeah. in there in terms oh, of you. You know, how much people have appreciated um, this this complete journey and overview, you know, going through, starting from those theoretical frameworks, you know, moving right the way through to the practical advice. Um, and I think what you've done is you've shared your superpowers with us to give confidence in a sense to, to early years practitioners in, journey, in Jersey. And I think that's just amazing. Um, so I'm sure that people would want me to give you, you know, the most heartfelt thanks for a fabulous presentation. Incredibly well done. Well, that, that's a huge thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. It's always always lovely to hear. It, it's difficult to know when you can't see your your audience. It's difficult yeah. to know what people are thinking. So, so thank you for that. I, I really do appreciate that. And and you know, I want to finish by saying. Um, um, well, first of all, remember you are professionals, you make decisions and the best of luck with everything that happens because um, you will do, as teachers, early as teachers always do, a fantastic job, you will do that and trust your professionalism to do that because um, that, is your most, that is your most valuable cognitive resource. It's informed by everything else, but it's, it's how you make the world that children live in the, the way it is and um, yeah, I salute you. Thank you. So